Welcome to the Creative Plane Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. So this is A Geek's Guide to Storytelling and Your Empire of Words. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about audiobooks, and we're going to talk about podcasts, and blogs, and stories, and novellas, travel logs, and just general kind of role-playing and idea generation, um, because that's basically what this is all kind of going to be about. Uh, but before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Okay. And you are aboard. <laughs> well, you know, it's first day, yeah, and I understand that. And also, I, nobody can get the door. And nobody can get and nobody can get the door. So maybe we'll kind of trickle in, and by the time we get to the end, it'll be just packed. We'll be crowd surfing. It'll be awesome. Okay. So you are aboard a small ship when you notice tentacles coming up either way. Side. I want you to take just a minute and think of three ways that this story can go. You can jot them down if you want. Just take a couple of minutes to think about it. Which way is it going? You've got tentacles, you've got hope. What's happening? And ask yourself the question, where did your mind go first? Did you start thinking in terms of genres? Adventure, maybe pirates, perhaps? Sci-fi, because I did say ship and hull. I didn't necessarily say water. Spaceship. Spaceship, and you know, Spelljammer did just come out for for uh, Wizards of the Coast, so a lot of people their their head is right there. Yes, uh, a lot of the popular answers are Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, or you know, Call of Cthulhu, because you know, Rincon is just right over there. You know, why not Call of Cthulhu? So, the biggest thing about this, and what we're going to talk about in the first part of this today, is iterating multiple things. That's the, probably the most important thing. So first of all, um, who is this guy that's talking to you up in front? Um, well, I'm an audiobook narrator and producer. I've done about 50 titles. Uh, I am a role player. I've been playing probably since, oh, gosh, I don't know. I've been playing since age 11. If you want to do the math, then you sure can. I'm also a writer. I do travel logs, short stories, and all that kind of stuff, too. Uh, and I am also a podcaster. I've developed a few different podcasts and a few different things to kind of put out there in the world. And what I want you to think about as you're sitting in here with your storytelling is start with a thing. It could be anything that you find inspiring. Um, it could be an experience. For example, I took my son to San Diego Comic Con. And this was for his high school graduation. And I decided to write a travel log about it, which was pretty fun. And I kind of really enjoyed doing that. And I think, well, what's the next iteration? How can I take that thing, that written travel log, and make it into something else? And then I turned it into an audiobook. And of course, that audiobook required a cover. Now, not everything that you make is going to work out. But even the stuff that doesn't work out is still a thing. For example, How to Survive a Horror Movie. Seth Graham Smith, if you guys remember Seth Graham Smith, he did Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, really, really amazing author. And I was like, oh, I really wanna, I really wanna narrate one of his books. But as you can see on there, my name is not Johnny Heller, so I did not get the job. Uh, I've got quite a few of these actually where I, I didn't actually get the job, but you know I still have those auditions that I sent in and I thought well, that's still a thing. I can turn it into Audiobook autopsy, which is I'll talk about what I did what I did wrong how I can do it better next time And I can make this into a podcast. I made actually a pilot about audiobook autopsy and it was really fun. I got to take something that I hadn't looked at, a performance of mine that I did, and sort of break it down and, and start to go, oh boy, you were really green and you didn't understand a lot of things there. Um, and what you could do better next time. Uh, you know, the big thing is to kind of, what you're gonna be creating, just try to, try to use the whole buffalo, is what we're talking about. So here's another one. Uh, my son wanted to learn about editing, and so I went over to uh, Project Gutenberg and I found some fairy tales. 
And I thought, oh, these would be great. I, you know, he could practice editing on these. I'll just go ahead and talk them all the way through it. And then he can practice his editing. Um, and I thought, well, it's not really a podcast, but it is kind of fun. So maybe we turn it into something called Fairy Tale Jukebox. And I did another pilot, pilot on that too, where I just took this fairy tale. I think Red Riding Hood is the one that I have out there right now. Really fun, breezy. You listen to it, really cool. And it was a chance for him to actually uh, to get some experience with audiobook, um, audiobook editing. So one other method. Take two things that are unexpected and put them together. You could say a Reese's peanut butter cup of you know, something cool. So in this case, I like things that are geek. I like things that, I love wine. I just love red wine, I love white wine. I, I, just, I think it's wonderful. So you put them together and you get geekery and wine. And I did 12 episodes of that particular thing where I took a bottle of wine and something from geek culture, a video game or you know, a, a comic book or something and paired them together. But you know, it still wasn't quite enough. It wasn't enough to talk about, to have a full podcast episode. So what I did is I started writing things down, how it would be, you know, the geek side, the wine side, what's that other element? So I added liner notes. I took the first 12 audiobooks that I made and talked about the production process and how I spoke to each one of the rights holders, how I got to yes how each one of them was like, okay, I don't really understand how this works, and I would kind of coach them through it, and I would get them to that point where they said yes to make the audiobook, and what was challenging about each book, because it was my first time doing a lot of things, putting together a lot of characters that had differing voices, having to do research for all of those kind of, um, you know, those uh, nonfiction personal names that are very important to the person that they, that owned those names. So, yeah, and what I would do differently knowing what I know now. Uh, and then I made that into a whole blog and then put it together and made it into kind of a new, a new equation. Uh, and then I released it for free. The equation was 10 minutes on the geek side, 10 minutes on the wine side, and 10 minutes on the audiobook side. And I put out 12 of those episodes and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Is there any other iterations that I could do of this particular thing? Well, I could turn it into the first case, one more level. I could add interstitial pieces in between those and I could talk about things in the audiobook universe. I had a really wonderful lunch one time with Scott Brick and he's a very famous narrator. He's done about 700, 800, 900 audiobooks. He's pretty amazing, Narrators Hall of Fame. Really enjoyed spending time with him and I wrote a story about that. Uh, I did another one where I went to my first uh, narrator's boot camp and got my first bit of training and I was absolutely petrified to read in front of the other people who are professional narrators. It's like, I'm gonna read in front of these people, I don't think so. <laughs> so, and so each time you add something, I added interstitials and stuff like that, but each time try to add something more that has a little bit of, of value to it. So you're not just regurgitating those things that you have, you're taking an idea and kind of iterating on it. Um, last one, write a story that only you can write. Um, I changed careers. I was a theater teacher for a long time, and I became a stay-at-home dad. But I wanted magic in my world. I wanted adventure in my world. And so I created a story called The Adventures of a Stay-at-Home Shaman. <laughs> and I wrote the story. And it was, it was really fun and kind of a neat way of, of addressing those things in my life that I wanted to create. So once you make a single thing, make a lot of it. Make more. So I did San Diego Comic-Con, and I thought, well, why not New York Comic-Con? Why not Gen Con? Talk about each one of those things, and so each one of those iterations becomes a way for you to kind of explore and grow in that particular art form. Again, make one thing, and then make more. So I have actually seven stories in the Stay at Home Shaman series. Seriously, this is so important. Make one thing, make more. <laughs> Podcasts, so again, make one thing, make more. Now, what that means is that you explore it until it's done. While it's still giving you joy, enjoy it, and then when it's done, you're done, and that will end up defining, defining the creative periods in your, in your creative life. For example, you might have a series, I had a series of audiobooks that were all about pop culture. James Bond, Gilmore Girls, 
uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, all about pop culture. And then I had something that was all about comic books. I did something about Batman, Wonder Woman, and Supergirls in general. And it ends up defining your creative periods as you go on through, through your career. Uh, and side note, where do you publish those podcasts? Uh, there's a place called Anchor FM, and it's actually uh, owned by Spotify. And it can get you on a lot of things. It can get you on like Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, all of these things just by putting it on uh, Anchor FM. And they even have a, a recording software that you can use to create. But here's the thing. It's hard to go to alone. You do need an adventuring party. So assemble your adventuring party. I like classic. I go fighter, magic user, cleric, rogue. Yes, technically thief. I know, but rogue is so much more romantic. Thief sounds bad. It just you know. So don't you know, rogue. Let's see, just rogue. So my fighter, uh, my fighter is the tank. This is the person who helps you win battles and soaks up damage, right? This is for me, my editor and my proofer. Uh, the damage is the stuff that I find just painfully boring to do, and she breezes through like it's nothing, which I think is just wonderful. And the cool part is like my fighter actually has a black belt in Taekwondo and is an actual volunteer firefighter. <laughs> She's kind of the boss. Now, your magic users. So your magic users have arcane beguiling powers. These are your artists. So for me, it's Luke, Scott, and Jason. Uh, where do you find them? Well, Luke's right there. <laughs> he finds you. He finds you. And where does he find you? So you probably, if you are a gamer, you probably do Kickstarter. And I found this particular, the party backstory generator, and I looked at this and I went, oh my god, that's amazing. Where do I find that artist? And you look on the back of the book and there's his name. <laughs> and then you track him because <laughs> it's important, right? So this is what I, and so wherever you look for art, you know, look on the back of the book, look at all these people, and that can be another member of your adventuring party. Now, your cleric. Your cleric is the person that holds you to your highest ideals. He gives you the best version of yourself. Uh, he makes sure that you stay pure of heart. And for me, this is Javier Grigio Marks Watch. Uh, he is, he's a cool dude. He, um, he works in television. He was a writer producer for Jim Henson's Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, as well as the live version of Cowboy Bebop. Uh, he's working on the next season of The Witcher. He's worked on one called Blood and Treasure. And then he created a series called The Middleman, which was actually started out as a comic book that he then pitched into the idea of uh, a TV show that lasted a season that was really hilarious. If you've never seen it, it is, it's a fabulous, fabulous show. Javi does stuff just for the greater good. Like this, if you want to shoot this with your phone, that will take you right to his website where he has all of his pitches and his scripts and all the things, and he just gives that stuff away for free. And he has a, a podcast that he does with Jose Molina. Jose Molina wrote on this one, uh, well, I mean, it was only a, it was, it was a science fiction western. It only lasted like a season, it was called Firefly. A lot of people saw it, they thought it was pretty cool. And he was on that, he's also a writer producer on uh, uh, Agent Carter and uh, Blood and Treasure. And the two of them get together and they talk about being in the television industry in writer's rooms. And even if you never want to be in a writer's room, it's amazing and really hilarious. And they're really good friends. And they talk about working in television. So um, the best hobby quote, though, is this, if you have a skill, teach it to someone for free. Especially if you're a writer. Because if you make it, it won't just be because you're great. It'll be because all of the gatekeepers open the locks for you. And, and that's the, like, the best thing we can do to our fellow creators is to give them those keys so that they can find a way to express their creativity out into the world, to show them another place where they can actually have their art. Uh, speaking of unlocking locks and whatnot, my rogue. Mm -hmm. Yes, my rogue is, uh, he knows all the super secret stuff, the super secret languages. Uh, he's my technical advisor. His name is Stephen J. Cohen. He is uh, really amazing and also very rare. There's like 13 dwarves for every one of the hobbits that he is. So, and it's, 
he's, he's amazing. Um, and when I'm trying to figure out how to enter a locked room, he's already designed the key. He designed something for audiobooks where you just, you put your audio through it and it's called second opinion and it tells you where you missed the specs so you can adjust it for publication. And it's just like, he just gave that away for free, just cause. Pretty awesome. Now, so what does that look like in practice? I choose a book that's gonna make the world better. That's Javi's influence. And then I make the recording. Sue edits the work. And then Stephen's program tells me that it's within audible specs so that it's ready to go. Luke creates an awesome cover image. And then Jason does the lettering and makes it look like super, super awesome for the final image. Pretty cool. So now, audiobooks in general. But before, before we go any further, any questions? Because I can stop for questions or I can just keep going. I can go. <laughs> I can do this all day. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a URL code for Javi's website? The QR code wasn't working for me. Oh, man. Um, it is OKBJGM. OKBJGM. Got it. Uh -huh. And that's his whole website and all of his stuff is on there too. Did you find it? Uh, it's loading. Google. Yes, found it. Excellent. Okay. Any others? Yes. Tell them more about Middleman. No. <laughs> they, will go, they will go and they will enjoy Middleman so on their own. Uh, it's a lovely one, yes. So, audiobooks, my path. Okay. I loved, just, I love stories. That's the big thing. Uh, audiobooks are like a really big growing industry. $1.64 billion in sales in 2020. Uh, in the last 10 years, double digit growth every year, right? And 74,000 audiobooks published just in the last year. 45% of people over the age of 18 have listened to an audiobook in the last year. I mean, like, woo, right? So <clears throat> it probably started with telling the stories around the campfire. We killed this buffalo, made this buffalo. Sure, absolutely. But we, after all, we probably do owe a, a cultural debt to Homer. Um, well, or there. Uh, well, I mean, come on. Let's let's make it a compromise, right? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> and uh, more personally for me, though, I would say it it started off with you know, mom reading stories to me from my big my big collection of of, of fairy tales. Uh, but more specifically, it was this guy. So this is Ros Roscoe Lee Brown. He did a vinyl record of this, and it is awesome. I just want to play it, and you will hear what it was. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Right. Don't want to play? Fine. Here's what we're going to say. It starts out, and he says, A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a great adventure took place. And it gives you the whole Star Wars theme. I was so influenced by that and listened to it so many times, both sides, that by the time I went to the movie, my Aunt Linda took me to the movie of Star Wars, it went a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and I went, a great adventure took place. <laughs> they did it wrong! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not so much, but yeah. So he just, this, this vinyl record was my first audiobook, and it really made a big impression on me. And then it continued on through here, which was, I had my little Star-Lord uh, Walkman. I would get these great cassettes that I would get from the library, and I would get, are we gonna play it? Are we gonna do it? Nope, 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 nope. So this next one is The Red Death, read by Basil Rathbone. Sherlock Holmes himself, reading Edgar Allan Poe stories. And on that same collection, Vincent Price, reading Edgar Allan Poe stories. So I would go, I would have my little Walkman on, walking to school, and it was like this, I'm like, ah. Now, it was probably really like this, but you know, when you're listening to Edgar Allan Poe, it feels like this, but it was like this. So, and then it continued on through college. I listened to a lot of audiobooks going to and from college. It was three and a half hours each way. Listened to a lot of tape cassettes. And at one point, sported a mullet and acid washed jeans. <laughs> and then I moved to Denver, and I really liked jogging. And I got Stephen King books, and I ran through Fremont Cemetery. At night, they had a bike path that I would run. I had some great times. 
running through Fremont Cemetery at nighttime listening to Stephen King like <laughs> and then when I, also when I was in Denver I, I taught theater and learned a lot about uh, a lot about um, live audio production and that kind of thing too and then you know I decided I wanted to change careers a little bit but you know when you change you sort of worry that you might be seen as sort of a pretender right you don't want to be seen as an imposter so I then moved to New England and I got a little more serious about audiobook creation but I really loved RPGs I loved Dungeons and Dragons I loved Call of Cthulhu I loved all of these games and I was also really blessed with some really great game masters and they encouraged me to create characters at the table, and it was it was awesome. Um, but so many times, what I realized in a in a D and D game, or a role master, or any of those games, I I really wanted to play all the characters. Uh, and so for me, that was kind of like that's why I wanted to end up doing audiobooks. And the role playing game stuff is why I ended up doing Sly for it, Sly Flourishes, the Lazy Dungeon Master. And then I decided to do more in the role-playing industry because, you know, if you make one thing, make more, right? So, and again, it was uh, live audio. I, I got to work with the DAWs, the digital audio workstations, to morph things. I had a, um, an audio sound effect of Big Ben, and I needed a clock tower in a small town. And so I worked with that and kind of dumped the base, sped it up a little bit, and turned it into a clock tower in a small little town. And it was awesome. And so I got some familiarity with that, with worth working with uh, digital audio that way. And that's how I got to here. So how do you do it? Um, what do you need? And where do you find material to narrate? And do you, do you have the aptitude for narrating audiobooks? So what you need at its most basic is a quiet room and a microphone, a computer with a sound card, and some audio software, maybe some cables, and then you just kind of put it all together in a chain to get it from the microphone all the way down into your computer. And you can add a lot of neat things to it. You can add like popper stoppers and audio conditioners and all those kinds of cool things. You can add many things to make it sound really nice. Um, but one thing you need to make sure that you do is you need to make sure that you train your ears. And how do you do that? You listen to a lot of audiobooks. So who's good right now? Um, this gentleman, his name is Kovna Holbrook-Smith, and he narrates the Rivers of London series by Ben Aronovich. He's wonderful. He has this grasp of accents anywhere on the African continent, anywhere on the European continent. His American accents are interesting, but all the other stuff is like really super amazing. Um, Kevin R. Free does the Murderbot series. I don't know if you've ever heard him do it, but it's so amazing. He talks about how that just the, the, you can feel the audible sigh for these stupid humans that he's constantly having to deal with. <laughs> it's amazing. And then this one too was really nice too. Uh, Will uh, we came back and did and did an annotated version of, of Still Just a Geek. So um, no, not not just dudes, um, but also uh, Tavia Gilbert. She is wonderful, and Emily Wu Zeller is another particular favorite. She's wonderful. She does a lot of fantasy. Um, my best friend's exorcism is crazy and so good and just wonderful. So if you ever have a chance to see either or listen to either, uh, any of those narrators, definitely do. Now, in terms of like a pro tip that I can give you, always read from a tablet. First time I started reading audiobooks, I did it off of paper and I had to go back and edit out all the <laughs> <laughs> 325 <laughs> And it was, ugh. <laughs> so, now, you got all the tools, you ready to go, unstoppable. Where do you find the stuff? It's tempting, but a bookstore is not here. Here is actually better, a used bookstore. I found these in a used bookstore, and then I made something from it later on. These are astounding science fiction magazines that I found. Really, really cool. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But it's neat because when you go to the used bookstore, you kind of end up feeling like a, like a literary archaeologist kind of thing, uh, which is, is really fun. Um, so what I'm talking about are older things like backlist titles. So if you can get in touch with the actual author who made that particular book, it's super great. You can talk to them and say, hey, I want to make this audio book. And they said to me, so you just want to make an audio book and then you're just going to split what you make with us? I'm like, yeah. 
so we say yes, and then you just send us money. I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Seemed pretty natural. And then Bill, uh, Bill Fitzhugh, he published his email on the back of his books, which was really cool, because I said, do you own the rights to your audio? It's like, yeah, I own the rights to all my audio. And then, you know, that became a long-term partnership. Because, um, make one thing, make a lot. Again, make one thing, make a lot. <laughs> so it's a perfect plan, right? So what could possibly go wrong? Your author might be, uh, hmm, they might not own the rights to produce the audio. They might have gotten really excited with their first contract and said, oh, yes, 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 and they signed away the rights to produce audio. Now it's owned by their publisher or their agent or something like that where it's hard to get to. And they might not get it. Like, well, I don't understand. I mean, I like books. I make books. I, I read books. Audio, like, what's, what are we talking about here? That was more the case like five, ten years ago. Not so much now. People usually get the idea that audiobooks are a big growing industry and people like to hear stories. Um, also, it's one of those things that it's too new. A lot of times they're trying to recoup the amount of money that they put out to make that book. And so it might cost you more money to produce the audiobook than you will ever make when it goes on sale because they've already spent their marketing budget to put it out into the world. So that said though, you know, dream big. Maybe you weren't thinking about doing Dracula, but there's a problem. You've got 13 full cast, 20 single narrations, four duo narrations, 17 foreign languages, all Dracula. <laughs> it's like, okay, how do I make myself stick out? Um, you think you're getting this, and it's like, oh yeah, sweet. Uh, it's this, and it's hard. Um, but I've, I've personally done a couple of, of uh, public domain things, and it was okay. But now I want to get back to what I was talking about before with the astonishing science fiction stories. I created this thing called the Mad Scientist Cabinet of Curated Chimera. I had a mad scientist, and I gave him this accent, and we talked about things like going into the laboratory, and here's the things we made. And I then introduced each one of the stories and then narrated them. So it was like Tales from the Crypt. And it was fun. And I had a friend of mine who's very good at audio sound effects, mix in sound effects, and it was, it was really great. And by the end of the, by the, end of the uh, anthology, the lab blows up, and it's, it, it, it's fun, it's fun. But even like, Decorated narrators have the same problem with, 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 uh, with public domain stuff. This is Simon Vance. He's won 16 Audis, which is like our Oscars. And he won an Audi for the complete works of Sherlock Holmes. But then along came Stephen Fry, three years later, famous actor, and now you're splitting all of your sales that you had to yourself before because there's a new kid on the block and it's public domain, so there's no way to really control that. So another cool place to look is friends. Um, you may have a friend that wrote something cool. Uh, it'll get them exposure. You'll get exposure as well. They will never have a fan that's as interested in their book because you will have read it by the time you make the audiobook like three, four, five times, so many times, you will know it backwards and frontwards. Um, and then somewhere, I always have this dream, like somewhere there's this, there's this LA producer driving his car and he's listening to this audiobook and he's like, oh, we need to turn this into a movie. And you know, we all get rich and famous, like yay, <laughs> really cool, I mean, maybe not, but, and yes, by the way, this is, that's Scott, my, my wizard. Um, he, uh, he's, uh, this is his book. And I loved it. It was so great. I really enjoyed it. It takes place in Colorado and in, in, a, in a carnival. So it's a fun carnival atmosphere. And of course, you. You take your stuff. You already know the author. You could probably get a good deal. Right? <laughs> uh, make sure that you have a good reason to do the projects that you do. For example, for me, Supergirls 101, my kids. And, you know, there's still a pretty great reason, too, for doing the projects that I do. Um, sometimes, though, you know, you get the comic books and the role-playing games that kind of mix up in your head, so, yeah. Uh, when you're making stuff, make sure that you stay motivated. How do you do that? You listen to a lot of cool audiobooks, like things like Save the Cat, talks about creating really great stories, um, specifically for screenwriting, but any sort of stories, too. John Cleese on creativity, tiny, tiny little book, maybe lasts 
two and a half hours at most, but it's so charming and wonderful. And the last one, 4,000 weeks. 4,000 weeks is roughly like how long you will probably live. So that really sort of puts in perspective what's important to work on. It's like 4,000 weeks and then you're done. Well, there you go, okay. It's a little, it's a little dour for, to, be, to be sure. Um, John Cleese's one on creativity is, is really cool. And, and also he's, he's a very nice man. Uh, I got to meet him at the, at the music hall just over here when he was doing his lecture. Uh, just a really nice guy, nice fellow. Um, performers too are also another way to stay motivated to Smartless, the Smartless podcast with uh, Jason Bateman, Sean Hayes, and Will Arnett. Hilarious. They interviewed Jordan Peele about Nope and talked to him about, about his, about directing films. Fantastic. And most recently, Ewan McGregor was on. And it, uh, man, Ewan McGregor is just like, it's just wonderful to listen to him talk. So, do you have the aptitude to make audiobooks? Well, here's a test. Um, grab yourself a nonfiction book, and what you're going to do is you're going to sit in a closet. You're going to turn off the overhead light and put a light right on the book itself. And then you're going to sit in there and read for three hours a day. And if you stumble on a word, you have to stop and go back to the beginning of that passage and start over. And if you don't know how to pronounce something, a particular word, you have to stop and go and look it up. You can't guess. And in that three and a half hours, you cannot lag on your energy. Does that sound like fun? <laughs> okay. But I love reading to my kid. Cool. Now imagine, your kid lives in a closet. <laughs> takes three hours to fall asleep every night and makes you fix all your mistakes. <laughs> Long form narration is hard. <laughs> and that's just step number one when you record everything too. You've got all of these other things you have to do too. Quality assurance, correcting your errors, adding in music, uploading things, adding the metadata that's needed for people's phones when they, when they have it on their phones. It's, there's, there's a lot to it. Um, how long does it take to make an audiobook? About three to five times as long as the final output of the book. So 10 hour audiobook, 30 to 50 hours. <clears throat> you got a pre-recording where you have to decide how you're gonna do your voices and where you're gonna put them. And if the characters are in the same scene together, they can't sound super similar, which can be difficult. Also, you have to look up on YouTube or on a podcast and hopefully listen and hear how those people are pronouncing their own name because you can find some wacky pronunciations of people's names. And especially if you're doing a history book, like the, the Designers and Dragons books that I did, those are hard because some of the people they lived, that lived in the 70s weren't on YouTube and weren't on podcasts and have since passed away and you don't know how to necessarily pronounce their name. Who do you talk to? So, gear. Uh, if you, you need a microphone, this was what I used when I was in a rock band and then I used a ribbon mic and then I used a, another one that's kind of a box mic that it was really good, had low, low, uh, low noise on it. And then I found the Hulk 990, which is this lovely cardioid mic. And I started off, I was a musician, so I had a soundboard that I then turned into a, um, a digital converter, which is a much simpler way to record things. I like Sennheiser stuff, so I had these really great headphones. And then I moved on to Audio-Technica. And now, you look at that quiet room, the most important thing probably. You're probably thinking a booth, and yeah, you can have a booth, absolutely, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a booth. It can be a tent, or it can even be a closed filled closet. A lot of people, when they get their start in audiobooks, they'll do their narration in a closed filled closet, because if you've ever walked in there and you know it's like, it's super quiet. Or you might just try to isolate the microphone, but if you isolate the microphone, that can be kind of difficult. Uh, doesn't necessarily work. Here's mine, my audio, my, my booth, and yes, it's a TARDIS, <laughs> and yes, it's bigger on the inside. When I lived in New England, I, I had drapery that went around the outside of the room. So you can kind of see along the outside edge of the room there, I just had these really thick draperies, and it made it nice and, nice and quiet. Um, it was, however, the pump room for our house. So if someone flushed a toilet, or did some laundry, or watered the lawn, <laughs> all of a sudden you heard <sighs> So that was challenging, for sure. Um, and then you need a DAW, which is the program that you record with. 
this is Audacity, it's free. Uh, Pro Tools is sort of the industry standard. I found Audacity to be like this and, and Pro Tools to be a little bit too much. So for me, uh, Audio Forge Audio, Audio Station, uh, SoundForge Audio Studio is perfect for me. It was just exactly what I needed. So, <laughs> And as you start to upgrade, you're gonna upgrade, you might upgrade your equipment as you do this. Um, but one thing you need to keep in mind is that people will then listen to all of your amazingly upgraded sound on $8 earbuds, which, you know, kind of, kind of blows your mind. So, yeah. All right, are there any questions? We've got like some more time yet. I can keep going, but anyone out there with a question? What about you, kid? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> Now that you can, should you? <laughs> should you, as the author, be reading your own work? I have a theory. It's called the race car driver and the race car mechanic. The mechanic is the writer. Knows this particular story that you have written backwards and frontwards. Every nut, every bolt, they know it. However, you've also rewritten that thing so many times, you might be a little bored with it. Yes. <laughs> and you have to have the illusion of the first time when you're narrating something. You have to have that energy that's the illusion of the first time. And if you, and if you know you've edited this thing five times, you might be a little lagging through there. Now, the race car driver, he's just going to take this. He might not understand how the story works, but he's going to take this thing and drive it and just get the most performance out of it as you can. Just make it go awesome. Not thinking about how it's constructed, just trying to make it sound good. And there, you know, are there people who do both? Yes, absolutely there are. Um, Obs, amazing, right? Also awesome. She wrote the, Julia Whalen wrote that book and, and narrated it. She also did My Oxford Year, which was just wonderful and transcendent. Uh, this next one though, Travis. Travis Baldry did this book called Legends and Lattes. A novel of high adventure and low stakes. There's an ogre who are, and she decides she wants to open up a coffee shop because she's tired of adventuring. So it's about the construction of the coffee shop and the loves and, 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 and adventures that they have in running the coffee shop. It's wonderful. Uh, I really recommend it. And he decided he wanted to do that last November as part of NaNoWriMo. He, that's how he did it. He did, did all of that, and then he took it. He's like, oh, I actually finished it, because he says he'd done it many times before, but didn't finish. And he finally finished, so he went through more edits, took it around. People seemed to really like it. He published it himself, had a great experience with it, and then it got picked up by Tor, and is now being you know, everywhere, which is pretty cool. Uh, narrating is voice acting, and voice acting is still acting. So you have to remember that this is acting. What does your character want? What are they gonna do to get what they want? If they don't get what they want, how will they react? Um, and you can only get that across with just your voice. So now it's me. Where do you sell these things, anyway? Well, you can go on eBay, put them on a thumb drive. You can go, you can make an app, which is a single app that you could write. You can go to audiobooks.com. Books should be free is another place you can release things. That's problematic because it's free. And then LibriVox, also free. So you're not going to make any money off of it. Um, you could run a Kickstarter and then push it out to the people who helped you support the Kickstarter. And of course, there is Audible. Uh, Audible is about 70% of the audiobook market. And it's, it gets a lot of places, um, and your way to get into Audible is through this thing called ACX, the Audiobook Creation Exchange. And you can post a demo, you can uh, add things into, you know, you can uh, make connections with authors, but you know, some of the ones on ACX are not necessarily great. They're probably chasing a trend that's played out. The writing may not be all that awesome. But one of the things you can do is you can find an author that you want to work with, like what I did with Scott, and you can, you can bring your own date to the dance. And you can bring your own work to the dance, too. And narrate it and hire yourself on, a, on ACX and then publish it through there. Um, but keep in mind that once you've done that now, now you're technically your own publishing company. 
and you need to think about marketing and how are you going to market the work and how you're going to get it out there. Um, Audible says we will market with the same vigor as we do with all of our high quality audio products, which means you're all the same. Do your best. We will not necessarily give you a whole lot of attention. So what do you do? You, you do blogs, you do websites, you know, audio blogs, stuff like that. You do presentations, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you decide that you, know, you still would like to be a narrator, um, there is another place that you can do, if you still decide that you love it, you can go to a place called Narrator's Roadmap. Karen Cummings did uh, a wonderful job putting together uh, paths that start from the very beginning all the way through advanced narrators, how they can get more training and whatnot too. So, yeah. Um, thanks for your time this afternoon. Um, in terms of like what's next for Last Word Audio, we've got uh, Stay at Home Shaman number five coming out here in October. And then November, we're gonna do six. And then seven, well, gotta write the story first. But it should be out in December. This is gonna push me. I'm saying it out loud. You're all here to say, this is gonna be out by then. Uh, and also, we've got uh, Designers and Dragons. The Aughts is gonna be released in January. And uh, hopefully also, uh, the first case of Geekery and Wine. So I just need to finish putting that together. Huzzah. Now, any other questions? Actually, wow. We did pretty well on time-wise. We have eight minutes. I could tell you some other Easter egg things if you wish, unless you have more questions. You, sir? No, nope. really good presentation. Thanks, man. <laughs> I, like, I know next to nothing about the creation of audiobooks, so cool. yeah, it's an interesting window into that world. It's yeah, very interesting. yeah. How about a bonus Easter egg while we're still here? Try to own your work as much as you can. There's a lot of people that don't own their work. And a lot of people that you know and respect that don't own their work. Um, in audiobooks, one of the things that a lot of narrators do is they get paid per finished hour. And they get paid per finished hour and then that's it. So there might be something that is sold for the next 10, 20 years and you don't ever see a dime because you got paid per finished hour. Um, the one that I mentioned before, Masters of Deception, the, the gang that ruled cyberspace, that was my first audiobook. I own it. And every quarter I send a check to the authors of that. It's not a big check, but it's still fun. Four times a year I get to send them some cash and I make a little bit from what we made in 2010 which is pretty cool. Um, and then also I think another egg is to ask, does your art necessarily need to support your whole life? It adds pressure, you know? Um, it makes it feel a lot like work. And if you think about like Herman Melville, well, you know, he was a customs inspector. And he only made $556.37 for the US release of Moby Dick. Not a lot, but you know, he was also a customs inspector, so he didn't have to. What else? Oh, I'll tell you how you come up with those voices, if you'd like. We start off with uh, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Think of that, think of your voice in terms of those. And you're talking about someone who's really young, might have their voice up here, all the way down to someone who's really gruff and older and has a lot more stentorian things. You could talk about it in terms of placement. You can have it all the way back in your throat, all the way up to the front, making it sound really brittle. Um, you can talk about your rate. It could be very fast. You have a lot of a lot of caffeine in their system. Down to someone who's very very languid in terms of how they talk, all the way through. You could have dialects. You could talk about different places around there. It could be anywhere from the United States to all the way over into somewhere like perhaps the British Isles, something uh, genuine RP, perhaps. And you can talk about the breathiness. If you talk about how someone talks, you can talk about that in terms of their breathiness. Or you could give them a speech impediment, like you might hear from Daffy Duck, something like that. Or you could put placement. You could, uh, you could talk about moving the instrument, kind of like uh, you see there, Mr. Gopher, from, from Caddyshack. There's also a time-honored tradition of doing a kind of sort of terrible celebrity impression. Maurice LaMarche did Orson Welles. That's how he got the brain. 
Andy Devine was trying to do Jack Black. That's how they got Pizza Steve. And Chris Hardwick actually was doing uh, Wallace Shawn when he was doing Glowface uh, for for the exes. Yeah, it's uh, kind of fun. You just do a bad celebrity impression, it becomes the character. Um, yeah. Oh, and Chris Hardwick, he's pretty nice too. He's a nice guy. Cool. All right. Now I kind of feel like we've taken it all the way up to the time. We good? Anyone have any questions? Well, I'm curious. Do you like reuse the voices too for different characters and different works, or? You try to make them as specific to that particular work as you can. Like you could say, I have a German character. Yeah, you can, but that German character could have Austrian influence. It could actually be more a Frankfurt sound instead of a more of an Augsburg, a Southern sound. So you kind of try to dial it in as much as you can and be as specific with your acting choices as possible. Um, because this is kind of weird, but people follow narrators now. It used to be that they would just be following, you know, the authors. And now it's like, oh, Julia Whalen, I like her. I'll listen to just about anything she chooses. Mm -hmm. And my sister was that way too. It's like, you know, Julia Whalen, she's just so amazing. Have you read her new book? I'm like, yeah, I read her new book. <laughs> it's like, and she's really nice in person. I love her to death. Like, we talked a few times at, you know, the Audiobook Publishers Association. She's delightful <laughs> and super smart. <laughs> So yeah, you try to make your acting choices as specific as possible. When they get general, um, you know, it can be passable, but it's not going to be. It's not going to transport your audience member like it will if it's super specific. Like when that character has something. If you combine the things that I mentioned about creating the character voice, if you combine the breathiness, the placement, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, you can make it so unique that that is a singular character that will only sound that way for that particular work. And then the important thing is to make sure that you record yourself saying a few key lines so that when you get back to their dialogue and they haven't been in the book since chapter four, you're like, how did I do that again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's, yeah, for sure. Great question. Yeah. Do you have a project that's the most fun? Oh yeah. my gosh. It's like saying, do you have a, ch a child that's your favorite? Yeah, you do. <laughs> 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 um, I have really been enjoying working on the Stay at Home Shaman series, although it is terrifying to put your stuff out there like that. And also, uh, Tales from the Dark Prairie was another one that I did that it's my own work, and because it's mine, it, it, it's more terrifying. But ultimately, it feels like a high wire act, and so it's more exhilarating too. Um, but I really, there's aspects of each one of them. That's why I chose them is because each one of them is kind of a passion project. So when I'm doing Designers and Dragons and I'm talking about the history of tabletop role playing games in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and aughts, each time I'm, I'm listening to myself as I read it and I'm going, oh, I like that. I want that role playing game. And I'll go track down that role playing game and it's like, ooh, Ron Edwards. Ooh, what's Sorcerer about? Ooh, what's My Life with Master about? And I'll go find all of these hard to find games and it'll, it'll bring in those nerdly uh, aspects of collecting too. And it, it all, yeah. Each one of those projects has that kind of zing to it. And I think it, it makes it more fun. Like I did, I, I was, I wanted to do something that was for my, my youngest. Yeah. And so I did this one book called Snotty Saves the Day, which is about this person kind of finding their true self. And it was just this wonderful piece with all of these great characters in it. And it was big and bizarre and like a fairy tale. And it was, it was wonderful. And I think I just get swept up in the moment of, of each work as, as you're doing it. And that's what makes it powerful to the listener. They can feel that, they can feel that passion. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you coming out today. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And feel free to enjoy our other shows, such as D&D &D Journey of the Fifth Edition and Scion Ragnarok and Roll, a Scion hero to Ragnarok story. Thank you for listening. <laughs>